Okay. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Welcome to my talk. Um, my name is Simon Martinelli. As you can see, my slides look a bit different. That means I'm not a Wadiner. But I was invited to speak here at the conference, and uh, I could even choose the topic. And I was thinking, what could be interesting to Wadin developers that they may not already know about Wadin? And so I decided to go for testing because in my current project we do a lot of automated testing because I'm working in a project where we create software for the Swiss Gymnastics Association, that's the biggest sports association in Switzerland. And uh, all the testers or most of the people working on that project expect the software developers are volunteers. So that means they don't have that time, we don't have a full-time tester. And uh, this started to be kind of a problem because uh, we did some implementation. We tried to our, do our best in testing. And then it was tested by the volunteers. But you know, they don't test really structured. Probably they are not professional test testers or test managers. They don't know how to do that, in fact. And so we were looking for a solution. And we started to do testing with Vadim. And it turned out. Uh, that Vadin is perfect fit for testing because it uh, provides some functionality that is missing with other um, front-end technologies, for example, so it makes it easy to test. So some words about me. First, uh, I'm already working close to 30 years in software development. I'm relatively new to Java, so, uh, to Vadin. I started in 2019. And it was a customer project where I came first in touch with uh, Vadin. And uh, I was lucky because it was already Vadin Flow uh, in my uh, case. And so I did a lot of uh, work now in the Vadin field. I even do workshops and presentations and stuff. And that's why I'm a Vadin Community Award member. I'm also a teacher at the uh, Java User Group uh, at the uh, University in Bern and the uh, University in the Northwestern Switzerland, and uh, I'm a Java user group organizer in Bern. So if you're in Bern, join our Java user group, or if you like to talk there, just uh, get in touch with me and we can arrange something. So when speaking about testing, most of the time you see something like that. Who already seen that pyramid somewhere? So the idea of that is that you have different levels of testing. So starting on the bottom, we have the unit tests that just tests logic. The problem with the unit testing in my case is most of the applications I'm working on are business applications. Do they have a lot of business logic? No. What do they do mostly? Read data from the database, display it in some grid or a tree, for example. Then someone can click on something edit the data and save it back to the database. So most of the logic is validation logic, for example, or we have a huge data model, like for example in ERP system, where we have the referential integrity checks on the database, so there is not a lot of business logic. <coughs> so that leads to the next step, integration testing. And uh, integration testing means that we also have, for example, the database, but we could also have other resources, for example, a messaging system, or if we are in a kind of a microservice architecture, we would have other microservices that we want to use um, during testing. And finally, we have this end-to-end -end testing and with the UI. And if you look at that, the pyramid means that you have a lot of unit tests, less integration tests, and only few end-to-end -end tests. And uh, this usually looks like that. Uh, if you start with the project, uh, there we developers will start doing unit tests, especially in projects where back-end and front-end team is separated. So usually I'm from Switzerland and uh, the common framework there is Angular. So most of the projects I see these days are using Angular, despite that React is um, obviously more popular, but in Switzerland they started to use Angular like 10, 15 years ago when it started and they're still on that stack. And that means we have a back-end team that is testing. They're also doing kind of integration testing later in the project, but there are usually only very few end-to-end -end tests. So 
practically no unit te uh, UI tests very often. That has several reasons. First of all, um, it's easier to do unit testing, right? So you just instantiate the class, call a method, check the result, and then you're done. And unit testing is very complicated because if you want to do end-to-end -end tests, you probably need a browser. This could run really as a browser or just as a headless browser somehow. And it's very difficult sometimes to get uh, working tests. We were also starting in a project where I started with Vadin in 2019 with TestBench. You may know this. It is using Selenium under the hood. And we have flaky tests. Did you ever had some flakiness in testing of end-to-end -end tests, for example? So timeouts, suddenly, suddenly some tests don't run, something like that. We have that often. So we even split our test suite in three parts that we can reduce the time it runs because all over the test will probably run for an hour. And uh, this is way too long. So we have, if we have test failures, mostly not because we changed something, just because uh, we have some flakiness. We have to restart it and wait another hour. And this is not, this, this feels like in 1995 because I started as a COBOL developer on mainframe and there I had to wait five minutes to compile the code. So it feels like back in these days. But the problem is that is completely wrong, this approach. Why? Uh, what does the end user see of your application? Does he see the database? No. Does it see your Java code? No. He sees your UI. So that means you have to test the UI because you want to test it like the end user does the test. That's the idea. And so there is a guy called Kent Dots. I don't know him. I just found that by uh, reading through articles about testing. And he's more into JavaScript development. That's why there are also mentioned uh, Cypress, for example, and other testing stuff. And he invented something called the testing trophy. And he said exactly that. So th he's coming from uh, JavaScript. That means he has, the, in the bottom of the trophy, he has the static test. We don't do that in Java, right? Because we don't have to do that because we have a static typed language. This is already baked in the language, so we don't need to have a, a linter or something that checks if our code is valid, because it's valid, it's compiled. And then he says, <coughs> because you often have not a lot of uh, business logic uh, to test, we have just a few unit tests, but the most part of our application tests should be integration tests, because we want to make sure that everything works, that also database access works and stuff like that. And then he has this end-to-end -end tests on top. This has also to do with uh, this testing matrix where uh, on one side we have on the high confident and low effort, that's the green, they are the green fields there in the matrix. Uh, they would be great, so low effort means it should be relatively easy to write the test. That's often not the case if you're doing end-to-end -end tests. It's even also not the case if you're doing integration tests. But the time changed a bit and we have new tools that we can use and this probably will make that uh, better. And from the article where I have the pictures, there is uh, Gleb Bamutov and he says, uh, the end-to-end -end tests are great because it operates like a user. And that means if you have a set of end-to-end -end tests, you can change the implementation underneath as ever you want as long as the end-to-end -end test works, everything's fine, right? So from a user perspective, only the end-to-end -end tests are like the user would use your application. Everything else is just for you. So that means very often unit tests are just written or integration tests are just written to check out if a certain functionality works. So if this works, if the test is green, you could go ahead and delete the test because it's no longer necessary. You already checked if it works and that's fine. So how can we go to this end-to-end -end testing, but in a way that it's fast and reliable? That's the question here. And when we have a look, I'm, who is using Spring Boot? Who is not using Spring Boot? What are you using, Quarkus or Java E? Java E, okay. 
I will talk about Spring Boot because Spring Boot uh, is probably the most used integration with Vadin, also the most used uh, Java framework, I would say, in these days. And Spring Boot has a concept for Spring Boot test. It's called test slices. What does that mean? Um, if you want to test things in your application, if you go back here, for example, to uh, the test trophy, unit and integration and end-to-end -end tests do not have the same requirement for the environment where you are running your tests. Means if you're doing it right, unit tests shouldn't require anything. Mm -hmm. That means you can just make a new instance of your class, call a function, get a result, check that, then you're done. So you don't need a database, you don't need Spring at all, or a Java E application server. On the integration side, uh, you may want to access the database, but you probably may not need a web container, right? So you need a context where your Spring Beans or your CDI Beans, whatever runs, but you don't need the Tomcat or a Glassfish or a JBoss or something else. So these are the test slices, and you can achieve that with the Spring Boot. One of the popular ones is, for example, data JPA test. That's the annotation that you use instead of Spring Boot test. You just test the database, and then only the database hibernate, and the connection pool will be started, and the rest of the beans are not available. So you just can test your repositories, but you can't test your services or your REST controllers or stuff like that. Um, historically, uh, when using uh, Testing with integration. Also, Spring Boot was using H2. H2 is an in-memory database. It's quite a good database. It has a little problem because there is more or less only one developer in that project. He's from Switzerland. He's uh, working for Adobe in Basel. And he's alone, more or less. So there's a second one also located in Switzerland at the Lake of Geneva, but that's it. That's the whole team of H2. And the whole world is using H2. And I'm, as you may have seen in, in, uh, when I introduced myself, I started in 1995 with Cobol and SQL. So I know SQL very well. And I know H2 is a nice ID, but it's only a mock. So it's not a real database. Th this starts relatively early. I usually use Postgres SQL database. And there uh, you can do insert statements. And this has kind of an absurd mechanism. So you can write insert into something and then on conflict do something else. Ignore it or do an update instead of an insert, something like that. And that's already something that H2 can't do. So H2 is already out for me most of the time when using Postgres. But lately there was uh, an invention. It's called test containers. Whoever heard of test containers? More or less everybody. So for the other one, uh, test containers is an open source framework. And it provides a way to run containers, in that case Docker containers, with whatever you need to run your integration test. So you usually use that with the database, but you can use it with the message broker, or you could use it with, for example, microservices. So you could put your microservices in containers, and then you run it during integration test, and you can access that. So that's a very very good uh, framework, and th the point with the framework is it changed how we write these days integration tests, because usually we go ahead and use these test containers. Now, the problem with the test containers tests is uh, H2 starts very fast, because it's an in-memory database, right? Postgres already also starts fast. I would even say it's slightly a bit faster than H2 in memory, because Postgres starts around in at least on my Mac computer, it starts around 0 0.7 seconds, something like that. So it's extremely fast. If you use MariaDB in MySQL, you have to wait like 20 seconds. If you use SQL Server, you have to wait half a minute. And the bad news, if you use Oracle DB, then the slim container image for uh, Oracle starts around two minutes, something like that. So if you're doing that constantly on your machine, there you may get a problem, but test containers also has a solution for that. It's, uh, as far as I know, still in beta. So they talk about reusable containers. That means you start the content just once on your computer, and then you do test, and it uses always the same instance, so you avoid the startup time. 
but you may need to clean up the data or the database structure before you run the test, but at least the, the container is already there. Now that's uh, more or less a general thing, let's move to what in flow. So I will not talk about Hilla here, I will just talk about what in flow testing. And uh, let's see what flood in, what in flow has to offer. So on the end to end part, you have TestBench. So TestBench provides end to end testing based on Selenium and WebDriver. You could use uh, Playwright, Cypress, something else, but the problem is with that you don't have support for the Vadin components because the great thing about TestBench is it's very easy to test the Vadin components with it because you have a test class for each Vadin component. Then uh, there was a project from uh, Martin Vishny, he's a, a Vadiner, so he's a software engineer at Vadin, and he created a project called Caribou Testing. Who has ever heard of Caribou Testing? Some of you. Uh, Caribou testing is great. Um, we will see that why this, how this works. Uh, Caribou testing has just a little minor problem because it was written in Kotlin. And if you are into Kotlin programming, this is perfectly fine because Kotlin has some uh, elements in the language like extension methods that you don't have in Java. So it makes it very a very lean code if you use Kotlin and Caribou together. If you don't use that, we will see that with Java, then it looks a bit ugly sometimes. But uh, inspired from this Caribou testing ID, there is uh, since 23.23 is Caribou UI unit testing. So the same ID, eh, not Caribou, TestBench UI unit testing, sorry. So the same ID as Caribou testing, but with TestBench. And we will also look, have a look at that. And now these two things, the UI unit testing, I'm not so happy with the UI unit testing because it's not unit testing. It, in my opinion, it's mostly used for integration testing. But uh, Martin was talking about browserless web testing. So that means that we have the same ID as with Spring Boot test and the test slices. We don't need to start everything to do a test. And because uh, what in flow is pure Java code, you could do the tests of your code on the Java side without even have the need to run a browser or to run uh, a web container. So you don't need Tomcat to do the test and you don't need a browser to do the test. That means they are very fast. Martin says on his blog that it's around 100 times faster than with Selenium, for example. Um, they are more reliable. I was talking about uh, flaky test. You also have to wait something, sometimes that the browser renders something before you can access it. You don't have that here. Uh, you don't have a browser, as I had already said. And this is so fast, you can run it like unit tests. So in combination with test containers, and you have a simple, more or less simple business application with just a database and some UI, you could go ahead and just create all your tests just with one of these browserless web testing frameworks, right? And what would be the benefit? The benefit would be uh, that you always test everything in your application. So it's not everything, to be honest, right? Because you don't have a browser, so you don't test things that run in the browser. So if you have some JavaScript that you execute, this will not run, for example, and you also don't see how it would look like. So with, with uh, Selenium, for example, you can create reference screenshots and check them with the, with the screenshot that is generated during the test runtime. That's something that you can't do. So looking how the application looks like, if the CSS is correctly uh, crafted, for example, that's not possible. But that's very often also not needed, right? So we, we want to, to test more or less the functionality. Now I created the test project. Those with the QR code, you can go there. It's on my GitHub account. You must uh, CH and it's uh, the name is what in create testing and we will have a look at uh, this project now to see how uh, this may look like. Now what you see here is uh, a fully Spring Boot application. By the way, if you would run it, it looks like that. It looks familiar, right? I just created it at start.wadin.com and I have a hello world view and a uh, master detail view. So that's more or less what you get when you, when you create it. And here we have, uh, as you may know, um, the editing of, uh, of the data and that's what we want to test. But first we want to test the hello world 
and uh, let's see how this works. For the Hello World view, there are several different tests. So let me see. Here we have like five different test methods. And they also don't have the same suffix. So as you may know, if you use uh, the test suffix, then uh, Maven, uh, it's a main project by the way, will Maven use the, the Surefire plugin and execute everything that ends with test or tests. And uh, if you add IT, then this is the default suffix for the failsafe plugin that you have to configure that uh, will start in the verify phase usually. And that's what you already have when you do that on on, um, on the startwadin.com page, you get like a profile. Where is it? It's called IT. And here in that profile, um, Spring Boot is started or the application is started and stopped at the end of the phase. And there the failsafe plugin is already configured. So you don't have to do anything with that. That's already ready fine. But we will see that in a minute. So let's start with the, with the Caribou test. Caribou test is a bit different from the UI unit tests, uh, first of all, I have to set up uh, it by myself. So here you have an abstract test. Um, and uh, this is auto varying the application context because this is needed. First, it discovers the routes so that uh, navigation will work. And then here with the Spring Servlet and the mock Spring Servlet is creating a mock environment. So maybe you know if you're using Spring Boot, there is mock MVC. That's the same concept. So if you want to test um, REST controllers without having uh, Tomcat running, then you can use mock MVC and this will just call the controllers directly without doing HTTP requests. That's also very handy because it's very, very fast. And finally, we, we um, tear it down, but that's not very important. That's always the same code. Um, that's nothing special. And here we have a, a say hello test. And the first thing we do, we use, as you can see, the regular navigate the method of um, login flow to navigate to the hello world view. Then we have some uh, methods and these methods are statically imported in that case starts with an underscore. So that's because um, Caribou is written in Kotlin and Kotlin added or Caribou testing adding uh, these underscore methods to the text field, for example. That, that doesn't work in Java because we don't have the concept. That means I have to uh, define what I want to get. And here the spec, that's a, a way in this Lambda to search for something. So we have with caption, with ID, with text, with class, with something like that. So this is used to access your data. And then on the next line, we set the value in the text field. And this is special because what we could do if we already have the text field, we could call set value on the text field. But this would work for sure but this would not do what you expect because uh, set value directly on the text field ignores if the text field is enabled or read only or not. So even if the field would be read only, you could set the value, but with this set value method here or this underscore set value, um, it's taking into, into consideration that the text field might not be writable. And then we do the same thing for a button uh, by the way, that's not a good idea with the caption. Huh? That's just for testing purposes. I would use IDs because the, these are much more stable, especially if you have um, an application with uh, multiple languages, then depending on the locale, you may see different captions on, on the fields or the labels. And then we, here we have the same thing with click that also respects if the button is uh, enabled or not. And finally, we look for the greeting and assert uh, if the text has a certain value, right? And if we run that, for example, then we see that uh, it just runs, first of all. And uh, the other thing that uh, you see is that uh, there is also something from test containers happening. Uh, the reason for that is I have um, include here in my Caribou test. I import the test application. 
Now, I don't know if you're aware of the newest features of Spring Boot, but Spring Boot introduced the ID. Uh, if you want to run your application during development, you could run uh, a test application. So this means the application class in that case is not in the source main Java directory, it's in the source test Java directory. What does that mean? The difference between the one and the other is if it's in the test directory, I have access to all dependencies that, are have, that have test scope. So in that case, it uses Postgres. And here I have a service connection that's something new from uh, Spring, Spring Boot 3.1 where I can just uh, define, in that case, a Postgres container uh, with an image, image name, and it will produce, so that's a factory method, that's why it has the bean annotation, but this service connection will overwrite Spring Data Source URL, Spring Data Source username, and Spring Data Source password for you. You don't have to care about that. So in other, all the days, you would have this dynamic property source stuff that you had to configure. Now this works with, uh, with the service connection. And if I would run this test application here, it would start my application, but in the test mode. So it would also start this service connection for me. So I could use um, the test containers in that way. Right? But that's just not so important here. I just uh, import test application that the service connection will be available in my test. And now, for those who've never seen um, test containers, test containers first starts a container called RUK. And this RUK container is just there to control the other test containers that will st be started, that you can have a graceful shutdown at the end when the application uh, or the tests are done. Then it starts uh, Postgres latest, uh, then the pool, connection pool, stuff like that. And finally, it executes somehow what in and finally it, uh, it shuts down. So that's what's happening here. And that's Caribou. Caribou is open source, free. Uh, you can just use it. And the same thing you can do now also with um, TestBench. And TestBench has two modes. So this one here, this test here, extends from UI unit test. That means there is no spring at all. That starts just what in that you need to run the tests but there is no spring involved. Um, this is fine for my test here because the say hello test doesn't need the database at all. It just um, has some UI stuff. And here there are some differences to Caribou because the navigate is uh, a method that is uh, from the extended UI unit test. Uh, and then we have similar things, right? So we have this jQuery looking syntax where you get uh, the text field with the caption. And then we have, instead of this uh, set value method with the underscore from Caribou, we have a test method that returns a tester. So that will return a text field tester class. And this has a method set value that will also respect um, setting the value only if the field is accessible. And then we have the button with the same ID. We can click on it and then we could do the same assertion as we did before, right? And if you need a uh, spring for some reason, so a fully spring boot uh, application context, then you can extend from spring UI unit test, and this will set up the mock environment in uh, spring as well. And here we have exactly the same test. So the, the Caribou test, the test bench spring unit, and the test bench unit tests are all doing the same, more or less, just kind of a different setup. Now, TestBench is the other thing that you can, or TestBench with uh, based on Selenium for the end-to-end -end test. Uh, and there you could also do two ways to do that. Regularly, uh, usually you would create integration tests with the IT ending and you would start your tests with the uh, integration or the IT profile that will start Spring Boot for you and then you will test it. Sometimes in my projects we do that differently. We don't start uh, Spring Boot we have a running instance that is already provisioning in a Kubernetes cluster or somewhere, and we test against that. We could even add uh, like Selenium Grid, which is a, a server that will route then um, the, the test execution somewhere, or we could use uh, Selenium Grid in the cloud and run the application against multiple different web browsers, for example. 
Um, so this will be a regular one. That means here we have uh, a TechBench test. This has newly, I don't know when it was created, uh, a browser test base. Probably this was created when introducing uh, the JUnit 5 support. And we have a browser test uh, annotation here instead of a test annotation. This would allow us to execute the same test with multiple browsers, for example. And here we, we have to call the get driver, so that's uh, web driver specific, and then we get uh, localhost 88 in that case. That probably doesn't make sense because it would never run on localhost or rarely run on, uh, on localhost in that case. Uh, but here we have the tests, and if you have a look at that, that the only difference more or less that we have here in uh, compared to the unit testing framework, uh, we have a test field element. So these are the elements based on the Selenium elements that are specific for the Vadin components that makes it easy to access specific stuff. We will see that with, uh, with the master detail test later on. And here we're doing the same thing. The difference here, it really runs an application or it expects to have an application running on that port and then executes the test. Another thing that we could do is we could also start Spring Boot in the test. So we don't, have to, we don't have to use the Spring Boot plugin to start the application. We could start the application here. And this is done if you use Spring Boot test because Spring Boot test will start a uh, fully fledged Spring Boot test application. And uh, here we use the, the feature of the random port. That means uh, Spring Boot will take care that it doesn't take a port that is already taken on your system. And then you, with the local server port annotation, you can inject that port and do the test here against that. So the difference between the test and the integration test is simply that the test starts Spring Boot. Now the problem is if you do that for each test, then it will be probably a bit slow, but that's not true. Um, because um, what's very important to know is if you're using Spring Boot test, Spring Boot test using caching. So this uses application context cache. And if you're using that like this, it will reuse the context. So it will not start a new environment each time I run a separate test. It will reuse, reuse that, but only if you don't change the application context. So how could an application uh, context be changed if you use mocking? So if you use mocking, you destroy the idea of the Spring Boot application context cache for testing. <coughs> and this makes your test slower. The, the faster or the better is that you really try to reuse the same context, don't do things uh, that destroy the context. If you have a test that really does bad things, you can use uh, that 30s context, if I find it, or TS context annotation, and this will tell Spring Boot test start a new context, throw it away at the end. So that's the idea here. But we don't want to do that, so that's perfectly fine. So that's very easy. And finally, we have also master detail tests, and these are a bit more interesting. I will just show you the Spring UI unit test, because here we have uh, really enhancements uh, based on the Vadin components. So for example, with the grid, we I just get the first grid. Maybe we should also get it by ID because maybe we could have more than one grid uh, on the screen. But then we take uh, the test method to get a grid tester for that grid. And this grid tester has, for example, a sort by column method, or it has a method get cell text. And then I can check if the first person displayed in uh, the grid uh, has the first name Aron, for example, in that case. Or I can click on a row and do a selection. And if it's selected, I can then go ahead and use the input form uh, to set the first name to some other value in that case and save it. This why I'm using uh, Aron Peter here. That's a trick because I need to, ha to have the same sorting uh, because I want to check if the first row is changed or not. If I would set Peter, for example, then uh, it will uh, refresh the grid and Peter will be somewhere down in the grid and I couldn't find it probably anymore. So I hit save and check if the data was updated, so if it, there's a notification or not. And finally, I can check if the name was really, was really changed or not. 
And uh, maybe for completion, this is exactly the same thing with, uh, with Caribou. So you can do exactly the same, maybe kind of a different syntax, but exactly the same ID in both frameworks. Now let's run that and you can see that this works. So, so do we run that? Let's see, take the Maven view. And here you see that uh, you can select the profiles or you could use minus P I T as a parameter when you run it. And then you run verify because uh, as I said, the fail safe plugin will be bound to that face. And now it starts also uh, the whole integration test. It even starts uh, the application browser because I didn't set it to, to um, headless. And uh, then, yeah, what happened now is I was closing the browser window. Probably that was not a good idea, so I killed myself or I killed uh, the test. So let's restart it again. Um, where do we have it? So I stand here that I don't touch the keyboard anymore. And now you can see that it really starts the application, does the tests. I have to go back here. And finally it runs the end-to-end -end tests with uh, the application that was started by the Spring Boot plugin. And finally it's done. And um, this runs 21 seconds, so that's pretty long for just like two tests, so hello world and the master detail. And if I would just run uh, the tests, and we can do that, we see how long this will take. Uh, it will also take a bit longer because uh, I have this ID with, uh, with the full Spring Boot test because I wouldn't do that uh, in a real world scenario. So let's check, uh, yeah, we do that like that. Let's start um, just this test here. Then you can see how long the master detail test takes. And this starts um, again. Um, test containers and this takes like two seconds, mm, pretty fast. So I can really use that, I could even go ahead. I'm not a big fan of test-driven development in terms of you write the test first, because if you're doing UI development, that's a bit strange, right? Because you usually, maybe you have designers that exactly tell you how the UI should look like, right? And then you can do it in the first attempt, correct. But usually there's a process, an iterative process to, to do the UI. And you have to, to work a lot on the UI and it changes everything. We are currently working on a um, mobile first application and there you don't have huge forms, there you have like step visits. And this is uh, terrible because suddenly someone says, hey, it would be better if that step could be split in two or we could combine the two steps into one because it would be easier and that means your UI changes constantly. So I would start to write such uh, UI unit tests uh, when we have kind of a stability of the view that we want to test. So not maybe that's something that not really test-driven development, but the point is that works very well. And uh, currently in one of the projects, we are only using that. So we don't do any Selenium test. We're just doing that test and we have around 70% um, of test coverage. That means nothing, right? That just means that we have a lot of tests for the UI, but it's very helpful because we really see if something breaks. And we ha also have this type of application that has very little business logic. And most of the logic is in the UI. So validation and stuff like that. And this is um, a, a, huge, a huge benefit. Yes, now let's see. Um, so that means in conclusion, only end-to-end -end tests cover the whole application, right? So if you do integration testing, unit testing, you just test the backend mostly. And that's not what the user sees. 
So you test something just for you as a developer and not something that is helpful in the context of, of the whole application. The point is with the browserless testing approach, this is very fast. So you don't do really end-to-end -end test, as I said, so your browser is not involved. You have no Tomcat that could have something, right? Because there is also integration, by the way, for uh, Spring Security. That means security also works, but not on the base of an HTTP request, right? Just internally, like the access check that you have uh, to check if someone is allowed to access a view, for example, that you uh, used with the rows allowed annotation, that works as well. So all the parts are working. Um, but the benefit is these tests are very fast. So you can just run it on your local computer. And as I said, the tests with that we are currently doing are running on my computer like uh, one minute and 20 seconds, all the tests. So I do that every time before I commit something. That works, works very well. Um, and um, on we also have that uh, running on, on the CI CD server. And we added a little end-to-end -end test, but they just run there. So we have specific jobs, like three times a day, they run end-to-end -end tests with the test bench with the Selenium mode uh, to check that if this works. So, but that's uh, not really necessary depending on the application that you have. So that's it. Uh, thank you very much. Are there any questions? Yeah. Sorry? Yeah, the question is, uh, are you aware of any alternatives to Selenium? Yes, I prefer Playwright, for example. Playwright is an end-to-end -end testing framework from Microsoft. It's relatively new, I think two or three years old. And it has a JavaScript API, a Java API, on the, and I think a Python API, if I'm not wrong. And it's faster than the Selenium web driver stack. But the problem with that is it's not so easy um, because if you have the grid, for example, I've shown you the code before. So uh, let's have a look at that again. So we have here the, yeah, let's take that one. Uh, no, it's not with the grid, it's, it's just an element, but let's, let's check the grid here. This will be the same with, uh, with, the, with the grid test element, for example. So you can access some stuff of the web components of Vadim. So they encapsulate the way how you have to access that in a test. Uh, thing. If you want to use Playwright, then it's getting a bit more complicated. I think I have an um, example here. Somewhere, um, probably this one. UI. No, that's not here. That's in the IT directory. Here we are. And here we have Playwright. By the way, that's uh, Playwright is, is, has a nice interface, in my opinion. So you create Playwright here. Then you create the browser, and uh, once you have the browser, you can do stuff. And here we have, for example, uh, a test where you can see that we navigate with the page, and then we have this locator, and that's uh, CSS selectors that we can use here to, to access the stuff. But uh, I think that's here, right? Yeah, we have here also a grid element, but the grid element is something that I created. And here you see that this selector is using like kind of looks like internal component or web component from the grid and that's not so easy to handle. So TestBench has a huge benefit because it has this uh, element classes for all your UI classes that you use. Yeah. Any other question? Yep. Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. Here you see some of them, like here on this line 14, you have the scroll to index, and uh, probably this could break some then, because you need to maintain that stuff. If you use test bench, then the guys from Vadin will do that for you, but here you have to do that yourself, so that's, uh, that's the point. Yeah, but there is also another one, Cypress, that's very popular. So if you create an Angular application and create components, you will get Cypress tests or stops or templates for you already. But I really prefer Playwright because in my opinion, it's less flaky than Selenium and faster. But I use that for uh, applications where we don't use Vadin. So where we use Timely, for example, or stuff like that, then use usually Playwright. Yeah. Cool, yeah. Any more questions? If not, I'm here until three o'clock today, so you can get in touch if you have some questions. And thanks for coming.